very good morning to you, Grenada, and the rest of the world on this, the 29th day of October, 2019. I'm George Grant saying good morning, and thanks for joining us on today's edition, the Tuesday edition of Good Day Grenada, my dear friends. It's a uh, so-so morning here. We've had, you know, some little showers off and on, but just before I came to sit in this chair, I saw the sun trying to shine through, poking its little cheeks out there. And uh, here's hoping that we've got a great day ahead of us. And, um, <laughs> wow, wow, wow. I don't believe what I'm seeing here this morning. Uh, just let me uh, rub my eyes here and make sure that I'm seeing the right thing. We have a new winner this morning. We have a new winner, Pilgrims. And I, I'm pretty darn sure it's the first time he's up there first. I am referring to Mr. Kipling Francis. Yes, sirree. And uh, I say congratulations, Kipling. And uh, welcome. And folks, please join me in extending congratulations to Kipling. First up on Facebook this morning. Second is uh, Benedict Cador. Terrific Tuesday. Well, terrific Tuesday to you too, Benedict. Thank you very much for joining us. And there she is. I just uh, just actually got off the phone with her. Uh, Sharon Roberts. Uh, she's third. So we've got some new contenders. Rachel John is uh, fourth. There we go, man. We have a total change up in the uh, in winner's row this morning. Well, that's nice to see. Everybody gets a little piece of the action, okay? Pilgrims, let's uh, take a look and see what we're going to get into over the next uh, hour. A um, little bit different program this morning. Um, we're going to show you two videos to begin this morning's program. Uh, one has to do with somebody who uh, many of us know and uh, respect, have respected over the years, even though he's long gone. I'm talking about none other than Martin Luther King. Do you know uh, the two the two program the two uh, videos that I'm going to show you this morning fall in line with our main objective here, and that is to not just educate, but to uplift people. To try and make you see things a little bit differently and realize and recognize that there is hope. There is hope. Uh, if we're willing to change our mindset just a teeny weeny a little bit. And this morning, uh, Martin Luther King is gonna give you some blueprints for life. Something that's been running around on the internet and I thought I'd share that with you. The second one is uh, one which asks the question, essentially, are we being fed too much information? Huh? What is he talking about? You'll find out in just a wee bit. Yes, we do have, I think we do have, yes, we do have the national report for you this morning. So that's coming your way after we do the two opening videos. And as I mentioned to you yesterday, um, Ray Roberts, who usually joins us on a Tuesday morning, is not going to be with us this morning. Uh, in about 10 minutes from now, he, uh, in about six minutes from now, he's supposed to depart on a flight. I hope he's not headed to Mars or Pluto or some distant place, but uh, he'll be back with us next week. So. Georgie Porgy is all alone this morning. Um, let's see here. Usually on a Monday morning, I try to show you excerpts from uh, the program the day before, Sundays with George Grant. Well, um, I was not able to do that yesterday because, of course, we had fiscal alert, okay, with the Bain sisters where they're trying to educate and inform Grenada as much as possible 
about the way we manage the finances of this country. Let me rephrase that, the way we should be managing the finances of this country in accordance with the law. And so I was not able to bring you excerpts from Sunday's program. However, I'm going to bring you uh, some excerpts this morning. Because, boy, let me tell you, we had one heck of a program on Sunday morning where you heard from a lot of people, well, six or seven people who were involved in some way or another with the revolution. I asked these people, you know, I said, look, uh, over the last 36 years, there's been a lot of talk about the revolution. We heard so many pros and so many cons. So I asked these people, I said, you know, look, 30, 36 years later, if I gave you a microphone and, and said to you, um, I want you to reveal stuff about the revolution that the Grenadian people have probably never heard. That's what they did. That's what they did. I'm sure that some of it, many of you have heard, but nevertheless, that was the way I put it to them. It was not an interview, no interviews whatsoever. No, 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 no. I just simply said, mm, here's a camera. You look into that camera, talk to the Grenadian people, and let them know what you want them to know about the revolution 36 years later. And I had a number of people uh, talk with me. And we're going to show you four of those excerpts this morning to replace the segment which Ray would normally be uh, occupying. All right? So that essentially is your Tuesday morning program on this edition of Good Day Grenada. Just before we get started, let me turn back here. Let me turn back here. Uh, okay. Ooh, okay. There they come. There they come. Uh, so we got as far as uh, Rachel John. Hola, hola. That's Mags. You recognize that, don't you? Good morning, Mags. Uh, Ryan Jabon is saying good morning. He's kind of early this morning as well. Claude Putna is saying it's a glorious day. Give thanks for life, you know. Just before I turned on this microphone, I was doing that, Claude. And in fact, I do it throughout the course of the day. As you move around, you see so many things to be thankful for. So many things. And da da da. Gigi Dominique, whom we saw yesterday, I think it was, for the first time, is saying uh, good morning to Lydia. And apparently Lydia knows Gigi. Ah, okay. Um, Lydia James is saying good morning and the viewers. And uh, uh, Lydia also says it's very foggy this morning. Yesterday was beautiful. Oswald Darbo is asking that we all have a terrific Tuesday. Thank you very much, Mr. Darbo. Ryan Jabon says, our lives begin to end the day. We become silent about things that matter. Martin Luther King. That's a quote from uh, Mr. King. Well, Ryan, I think you're going to be uh, moved by what he has to say this morning. So just hang in there for just a wee bit. Oswin Lewis is watching from an overcast Brooklyn. And uh, Aline Buddy Hosford. Are you new, Aline? If you are, welcome, sir. Welcome, sir. And uh, he's saying good morning from New York. So, yeah. Somehow it seems like most of our viewers are in the Big Apple. All right. Okay, folks. Martin Luther King. He left behind a legacy which we would all do well to emulate. Wisdom. This morning, we'll sample some of that wisdom 
in the form of a little piece here in which he talks about the blueprints for life. Check this out. This is the most important and crucial period of your lives for what you do now and what you decide now at this age may well determine which way your life shall go. And the question is whether you have a proper, a solid, and a sound blueprint. And I want to suggest some of the things that should be in your life's blueprint. Number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your own worth, and your own somebodyness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you are nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth. And always feel that your life has ultimate significance. Secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have as a basic principle the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. You're going to be deciding as the days and the years unfold what you will do in life, what your life's work will be. Once you discover what it will be, set out to do it and to do it well. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. Finally, in your life's blueprint, must be a commitment to the eternal principles of beauty, love, and justice. Well, life for none of us has been a crystal star, but we must keep moving. We must keep going. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl, but by all means, keep moving. And indeed, my dear friends, the world would be a better place if we took just one of those pieces of advice. Thank you very much, Martin Luther King, for all that you've done for mankind. Folks, it's 13 minutes after the hour, and uh, time to move on here this morning. Radio, television, Newspapers, magazines, the internet, social media, smartphones, desktops, iPads, Kindles, the list is endless. I'm going to ask you right now to pause for a moment and ask yourselves this question. Are we being fed too much information? <laughs> Take a look at this. Ask yourself that question. You may or may not find some answers. People have to understand. Are you using your device or is your device using you? Can you put it down? Can you turn it off? If you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you do read it, you're misinformed. Hmm. What do you do? That's a great question. What is the long-term effect of too much information? One of the effects is the need to be first, not even to be true anymore. So what a responsibility you all have to, be, to tell the truth, not just to be first, but to tell the truth. We live in a society now where it's just first. Who cares? Get it out there. We don't care who it hurts. We don't care who we destroy it. We don't care if it's true. Just say it. Sell it. My biggest concern is, uh, is the unfettered access to, to social media and cell phones, quite frankly, because there's a biology to these things that are as addictive as alcohol, nicotine, and gambling. Right now, a family is out to dinner at a restaurant, not enjoying each other's company, but each staring into the screen of their choice, completely ignoring the family members. And this is mom, dad, and the children all doing the same thing while they continue to eat. They did it the entire meal. Right now, 
An infant is getting their first iPhone and learning to tap and swipe all while drooling on it. 92% of two-year-olds play video games because that is what parents are putting in front of their precious children to keep them entertained and quiet. This is your life now. No natural behavior. Everybody's wearing clothes they don't want to wear. Everybody's showing up and doing something they don't want to do. They have no connection to. That's the problem with our society. And then what's the reward for all this stuff? Go home, get a big TV. Go home, you're going to get a shiny belt buckle. You're going to get a nice purse. You're going to wear shoes that you couldn't afford last week. You're going to get that dream car. And every week we're chasing down this new object. And every week we're trying to fill this hole in this, this, this sad shadow of a life that we've been left with after work. That you work eight to whatever to hours a day plus commuting. And then you're like this. And that's your life. That's your real life. All that other stuff is not your life anymore. All that other stuff is work. And most of us have committed to that. I know you've been there before and I've been there before. And we, we understand that it's a trap because we got out of it. But for the people that are in it, a lot of times they don't even understand it's a trap. They just think it's a good job. They think they got dental. I'm doing really good. I got my own parking spots, got my name on it. And you're just a piece of a heartless, shitty machine that makes money. All these kids that are graduating college with these $80,000 degrees that can't even work at Starbucks. All the people who put their money in the stock market and bought all this real estate, 2008, it all went away. Don't let anybody fool you into believing that there's a guarantee, that there's a safe way. The well-trodden path is the scariest way, in my, in my opinion, right? Because then you just spent the last 80 years of your life doing everything that everybody else told you to do, and you never really lived or produced anything unique. If everybody's going this way, go that way. We now know that many of the major social media companies hire individuals called attention engineers who borrow principles from Las Vegas casino gambling, among other places, to try to make these products as addictive as possible. In South Korea, internet addiction is classified along with alcohol, cigarettes, and gambling as an addiction. Well, you know, it's about balance. It's not that they're inherently bad, and it's, it's not that texting or social media is inherently bad, but it's when it gets out of balance. Um, if somebody carries their phone wherever they go, like they, they physically feel anxiety if they, if they put it down. Um, when they're with their friends and have to have it up the entire time looking at the phone while they're with their friends. You know, when they wake up in the morning and check their phone before they say good morning to the person sleeping next to them. These are problems. This is out of balance. I'm not knocking the phone. What I'm saying is we have to understand, we have to at least ask ourselves around the world, you here in England, wherever you are, what is it doing to us? Okay, okay. Yeah. You know what that means? Yeah? Smartphone. Did you see those people? A family sitting at a dinner table, totally oblivious to the fact that their brothers and sisters, mom and dad is sitting right next to them, okay? You think about that, you think about that. Um, just going back, uh, uh, hold on a sec here. Um, hmm, 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 hmm. Ryan says, yep. Media amplification and brainwashing, yeah. Social skills have been shattered by smartphones and internet addiction. Ain't that the truth? Ernesto is chiming in, and just going back to the piece we did a little while ago uh, about uh, Martin Luther King, Ryan says, uh, love Martin. And Sharon says, she likes this. Believe in your somebodiness. Yeah, sure. And I hadn't heard that. <laughs> I hadn't heard that put that way before. But uh, yeah. She also goes on to say, I told a young man last night that he cannot love anyone if he does not first love himself. He was confused. Um, of course I love myself, the young man said. But if you're drinking yourself silly because a girl broke up with you, you do not love yourself. Believe in you. 
Ain't that the truth, Sharon? Ain't that the truth? How many people have been shattered by broken relationships? Uh, let's see here. Uh, Ryan says, husband and wife in bed with smartphones. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> That's why Georgie Porgy is still a bachelor. It's just me and my smartphone and my pillow. There you go. Margaret says, for true. I guess she agrees with that piece uh, about what that addiction is doing to us. Will it change? I don't know. Okay, folks. That's our introductory uh, segment this morning. Let's take a break and we'll come back with the National Report. In our part of the world, we need to be prepared for natural disasters like storms and hurricanes, even outside of the season. I'm sure you'll agree that keeping our loved ones, homes, and businesses safe is important. So, I came up with a few quick tips to help you stay safe. First, make a family disaster plan and ensure that everyone in your household is familiar and comfortable with it. Remember to add batteries and flashlights to your emergency kit. Now for electrical safety. Familiarize yourself with your electrical panel as it may be necessary to switch off the power during a storm or flood. Make sure you install a transfer or isolation switch to prevent your generator feeding electricity to Grenlec's line. If trees are too close to power lines, call Grenlec at 237 for advice. By following these easy steps, you will be well on your way to being hurricane ready. Don't be caught off guard by natural disasters. Prepare now. For more information, visit Grenlec.com. You don't know how many hurricanes will be coming this season, so you need to be prepared. At Hubbard's Hardware and Building Supply Department and the Food Fair Supermarkets, everything from canned foods, flashlights and batteries, to plywood, tarpaulin, lanterns, roof repair kits, water tanks, etc. are available. For over 90 years, we've helped you prepare for and recover from storms. Hubbard's Hardware, Food Fair Supermarkets and the Grenadian General Insurance, an integral part of your hurricane preparedness plan. I'm always on the move. Training. Traveling. Competing. So it's good to know I have Quad Bank in the palm of my hand. Introducing e-banking, one of many customer convenience services from Grenada Corporate Bank. And there's more to come. It's swift, simple, and secure. Because your vehicle is a necessity, being roadworthy is critical. Hubbard's Motor Department introduces its new tire and battery sales and service outlet located at Building Supplies Compound in Grand Dance, close to the Sugar Mill Roundabout. Available are a wide range of competitively priced tires, maintenance-free batteries, oils and lubricants. Keeping in mind your busy schedule, this outlet is equipped to provide you with fast and reliable service. Simply drive in and you'll be delighted with your service experience. For more information, contact 4402087. Hubbards, quality service, affordable prices. All right, uh, let's just take a moment to say hi to Sean, who is now joining us. And time now to uh, running to our final segment for the morning. And I just want to repeat for those of you who may only have just, just uh, joined us. Unfortunately, Ray is, uh, I guess he's in the air by now, assuming that the airlines are on time. Ray is not going to be with us this morning because he has uh, to travel today. And so we're going to bring you a couple of excerpts, uh, one, two, three, four pieces here from uh, the program we did on Sunday. Uh, remember, we got uh, people who were in some way or another involved with the revolution, 1979-1983 to share their thoughts with us 36 years after that revolution came to an end. And the first person you're going to hear from is none other than uh, 
probably one of the better MCs that Grenada has ever had. And if I'm not mistaken, also a bit of a Calypsonian. His name is uh, Michael Mitchell, goes by the name of Senator. Check this out. My name, Michael Mitchell, popularly known as Senator. Senator, I was never voted into Parliament, but I was never thrown out of Parliament. The people's Senator. <laughs> yes, during the period 1983, I was actually attached to the Immigration Department and charged with the responsibility of writing passport. At that time, um, passport was handwritten, and therefore, you have, you have outstanding penmanship. So I was gifted with that, and therefore I was chosen to be um, writing passport. So I did um, work in that department, leading up to the unfaithful um, date in October. Um, coming straight to the point of October 19th, um, the demonstration, the freeing of Bishop from his residence that month, will, um, will then, um, and he being led to the fort. I actually happened to go up to the fort with um, the nurses who were carrying um, medical supply because it was stated that Bishop was not um, feeling up to mark, and therefore some nurses, um, including um, Sister Anne Alexander, then now and Peter. So I actually went up, assisted with carrying some medical supplies, she was happy, and got into the up room up on the foot. And in there, you had um, a number of persons, including Maurice, Jacqueline, and so forth. And while there, um, Bishop was actually, you know, moving up and down and as if gathering his thought because it was said that from there he's going to make some speech down at the market square. And while in the room there, all that I heard was a loud explosion that shook the ops room. Boom! And then I heard um, gunshots firing from inside and people screaming and the mayhem started screaming and I remember a soldier inside the room there um, Pochi, Pochi was like oh my god, oh my god ceasefire, ceasefire uh, and Bishop was saying um, oh my god, they have turned the guns against the people why have they turned the guns against the people and in the heat of the action um, next to me, lying on the ground I, when I looked to my left I noticed uh, that student from Grenville, Gemma Belma. Yes, it was Gemma Belma. Gemma Belma was screaming because a bullet actually struck her in the head. And that bullet struck her in the head and actually hit the wall next to me, ricochet in the wall and actually grazed my back. So I actually have a, a bullet graze in my, in my back. Yes. And while that mayhem was carrying on and people were screaming and the bullets were raging and Pudgy keep asking to cease fire, cease fire and, and Alexander then actually started to bolt out she was like you know getting all screaming and I said where are you going? Huh? stay down and I actually put out my leg and tripped her from her as she was going out. She fell on the ground and I came over her, sort of sheltered her. And she was screaming because she got struck somewhere in the buttocks. And that continued as if it was like a hours, <laughs> but it wasn't hours, the time was running very quick. And Pudgy keeps sh um, shouting, ceasefire, ceasefire. Then there was a lull in the firing and I heard a command, Come out with your hands in the air. And right in front of me was Jacqueline Kerr. So I held on to Gemma by the shoulder. Another brother held her leg. Another brother held her by the waist. And we was coming out in a half-crouching manner. And when we got down, 
the step of the, uh, the operation room on the plant there was vehicles burning, people screaming. I saw a couple who got, got shot on the ground. I heard a voice say, look at Jacqueline Craft, don't let her go. I say, oh, this thing is serious. So what we did, we stepped over the persons we saw on the ground who, met, who got shot, vehicles burning, smoke, and there was, I say, a lull in the firing, and we made our way to the casualty department with Gemma Belma. And she was like gasping for breath and oozing. And when we got there, they admitted her. Then I heard the gunshot. Because they had asked Bishop and Jacqueline Kirk and others to go up, up on the square, up the fort. And I heard the gunshot and I said, oh, this cannot be a good sign. So I had to move from the hospital, rush down to Springs, where I was staying at the time, pack a bag, and head up to Vincent's, and to my family. And strange enough, when I got up there about almost half nine the night, there were candle, candlelight prayers going on because my parents got the news that I got shot. And maybe I die on the foot. So they were singing praise and all of that. So I came like a ghost. <laughs> and they were happy to see me. I, I, I give them a brief come. And still, I, my back was bleeding, you know. I, did not, um, I didn't get no attendance. And when I, I realized Vincent's, you know, the hot zone, um, the home of Teddy Victor, the home of two of the, the dri security drivers, I said they will come looking for a number of guys. Vincent had, was known for having a lot of um, you know, strong supporters of the revolution. Therefore, I said, no, I have to move from Vincent and head up to the forest, to Granitan, um, to Pitiatan, Granitan, and eventually I end up at some friends of mine in Clojé. So, October 25th took me in Clojé. And following October 25th, when everything simmered down, I actually went over to Barbados to get treatment along with um, Sister Anne Alexander. Okay. So I was able to get treatment for my wound that was starting to get infected. So much so for October 1983 that I carry God. And what, you know, what, what, what stuck with me is you know, the mantra, the, the arms of the country should never be used against the people of the country. And, you know, we, we had a good thing going, the revolution had a lot of good aspect of it, you know, but, you know, we just, everything just died a sudden death. And I think we should take the good things, you know, agro-industry, marketing board, the international airport, um, scholarships to, to, to um, poor people, children, you know, these, these good aspects. Now, hang on a sec. Hang on, hang on, hang on. It's not you. It's me. I made a boo-boo there. I guess I was just anxious to get to that segment. I, I did promise you right before the break that we were going to the uh, national report. But for some reason or another, um, went on the iPad and punched up that segment. Okay. So we'll continue doing that segment right now, and we will run the national report for you towards the end of the program. Okay. So you're not going to be missing out on anything. So no, 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 no. It wasn't you. It was Georgie Porgy. Now, another very, very prominent or be it controversial figure involved in the revolution, it was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Hewitt Lane. Spent a lot of time studying law, and uh, he has not been admitted to the bar. But right now, he's spending a lot of his time, uh, believe it or not, trying to help others. He's been writing a number of articles which 
provide legal guidance to persons who may not be able to obtain that legal guidance. And I think yesterday it was, I think, yeah, I published the third of his articles. Folks, here comes Mr. Ewood Lane. But the issue I have been asked to just comment on briefly is my experience of the Grenada Revolution. And I will uh, maybe sum it up with a short poem that I wrote. The poem is called 1979, but you will see it summarizes what I consider to be my experience. It was a year of tumult and of bliss, of triumph and great festivity. But sadly, amidst all the dizziness, we sowed the seeds of 1983. That to me sums up my experience of the revolution. 1979 was a year of dizziness, you know, it was a year of great passion, it was a year that tremendous energy was released in Grenada. But uh, starting from 1979, I, I think we, we, we made certain mistakes that in a sense caught up with us in, by 1983. What were those mistakes? To me, fundamentally, uh, we, there was an absence of checks and balances, and it really had to do with the way it started, I should say, with the way we, uh, we took power, because we took power by unconstitutional means. And while it was possible, but we didn't have the wisdom and the experience at the time to recognize that it was fundamental to quickly restore all avenues of democratic discourse and democratic decision making so as to remove any possibility of any uh, tendency of undemocratic tendencies arising that could lead to the friction. Any human any human enterprise will inevitably have difficulties. What is important is that difficulties, conflicts, challenges. What is important is that there must be avenues for the peaceful resolution of these problems and these gradients. And I think we made a fundamental mistake in Grenada by not, by not uh, having that. So that will be one of my, my uh, that's one of my mantra. That look, uh, yes, it was a great, a, a great enterprise. It was a great venture. It started off great. It ended tragically. So my second mantra is always this: that there's easily the tendency to want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think there was tremendous progress, great experiences, great things to learn from the Grenada Revolution. And I think Grenada would be a poor place if we throw out everything. Yes, the mistakes should be avoided, the, the, the problems should be avoided, the abuses should never take place again, but there were important achievements, important examples that we really as a country, we need to embrace going forward. At the end of the day, the revolution and all that happened was a great Grenadian experience, was a Grenadian experience that we need to embrace as a Grenadian experience and learn from. Regarding the, the, the 1983 events and in particular October 25th, uh, I know many people regarded as a rescue mission. I can understand why they would take that point of view, but I don't share that point of view. My point of view is that it was an illegal invasion, it will remain that. And I know it is, there's nothing to compare, that's, that's one of the problems. It is not as if October 19 took place and there were a year and Grenadians were trying to work it out for ourselves together with our Caribbean neighbors and we were unable to work it out and the violence continued and in this, that context the Americans had to intervene. No, there was a traumatic, catastrophic event on October 19. And from the standpoint of many people, including me, including others, one tragedy, one trauma, October 19th, another trauma was heaped upon us in a very short period of time. And that's why I can understand the attitude of Grenadians and so But I really think as a people, ultimately we have to find a way to have a, a civilized discussion, a civilized debate about these issues and learn. Because ultimately it was Grenadian actors, whatever our... Uh, 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 events it was really Grenadian actors which is part of our Grenadian experience that we should we should go forward with so I will I will summarize as I said tumult blissful from 79 that ran through the period but at the same time the seeds that led to tragedy in 83 
we saw them in 1979 itself and increasingly they grew and in the sense they caught up with us by 1983. That would be my experience, but my second mantra is do not to own the baby with the bad water. Alrighty, there you have it. Mr. Ewart Lane, taking our time now to 20 minutes away from the hour. Coming up next, Pilgrims is a gentleman. This gentleman, I don't think, was directly involved with the revolution, but uh, I think it was back in March of this year. He was sitting right here with uh, Brian Pitt. They, uh, they were doing a program with me that day, and somehow the talk about the revolution came up, and Brian challenged this gentleman, Willie Joseph, to write a book about the revolution, seems to know a lot about it. And uh, believe it or not, Willie took Brian up on his challenge. And just this past weekend, Willie dropped by here to hand deliver a copy of this book. It's uh, titled The Grenada Revolution, which by the way I understand is available on Amazon. And so uh, when he came by, I told him what I was doing for the program on Sunday and asked him, you know, uh, would you like to make a few comments of your own about the revolution? Reluctantly, he agreed. But here's what he had to say. It's really very important for, uh, for all of us as, as Grenadians uh, who have an interest or generally interested in, um, in politics and government and so on, to, to bear at the top of our minds the importance of the, of the culture of, of the people, uh, the Grenadian culture um, generally and especially how we apply that um, in our political behavior. Um, that is a, it's a basic sort of fundamental issue, so too will be the issue of um, demography and class. But culture is, is, is really about those things that we do, what we believe, and why we believe those things, what we've practiced over the years. And in, in the politics, we notice, for example, that, um, that we have a, a preference uh, for liking of the leader, whoever the leader is going to be. Um, people call it charisma and so on. It's really about likability. All right, that appeal, that um, that bonding that people feel towards uh, towards the political leader. No, so 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 that is a sort of homepage point on it. So if we carry it forward to a couple of things in the revolution, experience during the revolution, one of the things that we would appreciate to begin with is that whereas the revolution uh, appointed a Mars Bishop uh, as prime minister and therefore leader of government, um, the Mars Bishop essentially uh, was accepted as a, lead, as a leader for the Grenadian people since 1976, that is to say long before the revolution. So it, on that cultural ground, it, and as things transpired, the, those who were in the hierarchy of the revolutionary movement were always going to be faced with a problem of reconciling um, the appointment that the party made uh, with the question of the acceptance on the part of the people of, the, of Morris Bishop as leader. And, and so, for example, when, when they turned uh, a very wrongful and, and foolish page that they called um, joint leadership, clearly the Grenadian people could not understand that, could not accept that, because as far as they were concerned, they had a leader uh, in Morris Bishop. And this hybrid, this, 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 this proposal um, to go that route, um, really, was not something that would sit easily with, uh, with the Grenadian people. So throughout the revolutionary experiences um, and events and so on, uh, you 
you come up against this whole business of reconciling or seeing how what is being done squares off with the culture and the difficulty uh, that they would have uh, when that is not in fact uh, in sync in sync so there were several uh, instances where they could not uh, do so for example uh, they never did come to the people to say listen we want to build we are, we are building a, a socialist um, and state so you had the party engaging in its own ideological work and and and, and set apart from 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 the cultural um, um, uh, mindset the, the backdrop of the people of Grenada who were not in fact interested in things of that kind you, let me give you a, a, an example so if under the ideology you talked about state ownership of lands and this and that and the other well the ordinary Grenadian by culture had become very accustomed to owning a small plot of land so you would have a lot of difficulty um, accepting understanding and accepting this notion of state control of, of, of lands and property and so on because the cultural norm had been that we enjoyed um, ownership of, of our lands as, as, as individuals as citizens um, of Grenada so so um, that is one of the things generally speaking that um, we need to explore uh, very fully um, as we discuss uh, the question of um, uh, what happened during those four and a half years um, that is that is the military conduct um, the operations of organs of the of the party and so on all of these things um, could be examined in relation to the extent to which uh, they were um, or they were reconcilable or in sync with the culture of the Grenadian people. All right. So that was the third of the four pieces from uh, Sunday's program. Margaret has posted something here. She says, you know, Willie makes an important point that is often overlooked. Maurice Bishop was the leader of the opposition at the time of the revolution. And he was an elected member of parliament at the time. Thanks, Marx, for noticing that. Uh, Cheryl Jarvis says, George, the culture of Grenada is the very, very reluctant acceptance of non-Grenadians in any leadership. So says Cheryl. Thank you very much. And by the way, uh, good morning, Sonia Mathlin Scott. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, folks, for those of you who would like to see all of the uh, segments we played on Sunday, you may go to the, it's on Facebook, it's on YouTube, it's on Grenada Broadcast, archived on every one of those uh, platforms, okay? Here comes the final one I wanted to play this morning, and actually this was the first of uh, that series that I uh, recorded. Mr. Livingston Nelson. Well, for me, the, the, the revolution is, is, is bittersweet. Um, but by and large, because I'm from Tivoli, we, we, we get the shot end of the deal, I would say. Um, I always say to people that Tivoli was probably the, the foundation, the seat, the military base that actually helped propel the revolution. And it is from Tivoli we able to take over the airport at Grenville, Birch Grove. From Tivoli we went as far as um, the Hermitage, Montrose, Sotez, the last push, um, Union, the last police station being in Guave. Um, so I know they had a real base here um, from Tivoli. Apart from that, some of the leaders of the revolution, um, the Morris, um, the Radix, etc., always visited Tivoli. Some of the people that came to give assistance to the revolution from overseas, always used to be coming in Tivoli and hiding in Tivoli. So some of the forces that really bolstered the revolution was from Tivoli. Yet, very soon after, um, Tivoli fell out of grace with the revolution. And so people from Tivoli was coined as counter-revolutionary. And so there was, there was constant 
um, patrolling in the night, you saw evidence of military barracks, of hats, sometimes under people's houses. And not only that, in excess of 20 persons were actually incarcerated from Tivoli. Um, the names can be supplied the next time. But um, some of the things I, 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 I witnessed clearly about the revolution is the way, the lack of dialogue, the, um, the way um, ideas and ideologies were just centralized and there was no room for diverse opinion. There was no um, other alternative interpretation. And so people were not just um, one, but people were jailed and people were tortured for no unfortunate reason. I remember some very small detail. I mean, um, I remember a guy called Tower that was just visiting. And Tower was placed on one of those big Janet trucks. And he was given a marijuana tree. And he held that marijuana tree. His Tower ended up spending three years in jail just because he was visiting. We had organized some demonstration in Tivoli, yes. And people came and see. And just people by the side of the road or just randomly arrested and those people spent three years without trial some people went um days without food some people were tortured and i think this would be in a better position to give you some of the names like winston simon broco and some of the other guys that were seriously tortured but um um i must say i later on when i analyze exactly what took place um in the actual revolution um I don't know if I am surprised or if I am just, yes, maybe, maybe they were surprised or maybe disappointed or maybe hurt. Um, we had a situation where we were fighting against a colonial power. That, that was the whole trust of the revolution. And yet uh, uh, in the, uh, at the end of the day, many Grenadians gone down, many Grenadians got killed. Uh, Morris Bishop got killed and, and executed with this group of persons. Um, Yet when the real enemies came, none of those persons that was in the forefront of the revolution they stood up and fight against um, against the, 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 the Americans. So were they cowards? Were they just opportunists? You have enough conviction and passion to to actually f to defend and to kill persons in the name of the revolution. Yet none of the, of the leaders, so-called leaders, um, got killed or injured when the real enemy came. And I always found that to be a missing piece. There are some other things I wanted to address. Um, when, they, when, when we talk about, um, well, we're fighting against um, imperialism. Um, yet we move from, uh, say, Imperial America, and there was this total internal fight where we wanted to go more into the ambit of the Soviet Union. And I wonder if we were just trading one leadership from the next leadership, or one group of a hegemonic power, and we're trying to cultivate our next one. And I also found that so disturbing um, and so opportunistic. And um, so when, when you look back at the revolution, you're wondering, what was it that the people or the leaders of the revolution actually believed. Um, another puzzling piece, I'm, I'm putting my thoughts together, so I'm going in. The next puzzling piece, some of the persons that were hardcore proponents of socialism, are, um, I can't help but notice the evolution over the years as they now sit um, comfortable with um, different administration and present administration that is cultivating an next imperial power. So how I mean, and now this imperial power is seem to be more imperialistic, want to take more hold of Grenada than even the Americans. So I wonder how these people that were leaders of the revolution and talking about socialism and talking about fighting against imperialism fought Gary on that tenant, won um, on that tenant, and then now doing everything in the power to get Grenada in the ambit of a next colonial power and is sitting comfortable in positions of power and authority in this colonial government. situation. There were some other pieces I um, I found them quite puzzling now as you look back. One of it being um, uh, some of the persons that, that, that were led to the execution of Morris would say 
oh, that the Morris was taken to, um, to, to, to the military barrack. And then I, I really asked the question, who was in charge of the military? Who was the one, the prime minister? But who was the commander in chief? If the, co you, you know, so it's like you have the commander in chief is at the highest level of the military. He chose a group of persons or thousands of persons. He was comfortable with them at the military barracks. Yet people were saying you went to free the military barracks from civil and when the head of the country, the head of the country was there leading its people. So again, some of those theories, some of the things that, that have been said, I, I, I found it quite disturbing. One final piece, one final puzzle. Um, yes, the, the new jewel movement was going around trying to educate the people, but history would tell you, and if, you, if persons that were here would recollect, the group of persons that did the most for the sensitization, the education of the revolution was the, was the Rastafarians. It was through the music, through the way of life, that they had a message that led to Grenadians becoming more radicalized, not just Grenadians, but people in the region more radicalized than everything else. Yet at the end of the day, those persons that even, did not even want to pick up a cutlash to fight, did not even see guns as necessary, wanted to escape what they call Babylon, were incarcerated wholesale in Hopeville. And I'm wondering what was the justification of the revolution for arresting, incarcerating, and torturing the Rastafarian communities so wholesale. Um, and it was through the music that people become radicalized and revolutionized um, and was ready to pick up to fight against imperial power. Yet these group of persons that did not seem to be a major threat to the revolution probably wanted to smoke marijuana. Yet these are the people that you treat them as if they were actual slaves here in Grenada. And those puzzles, those theories to me are extremely contradictory and, 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 and frightening that a group, our people, could turn on our own selves in that kind of way. All right. There he goes, Livingston Nelson. And of course, that generated some activity on social media. Let me share a couple of them with you. First of all, Cassandra Mitchell says, were the cowards friends or foes of the enemy US? Asking, because I do want to know. <laughs> uh, yeah, Margaret says, my neighbor in New York say, Livingston makes a serious point about trading one hegemony for another. We're always cap in hand. Now to the Chinese. Yeah, Mags, I did see that comment. Thank you. Ryan says, to murder a prime minister, cabinet, and so many fellow Grenadians for Marxist Leninism is quite dead political ideology. It is so painfully sad and brainless. Kipling Francis said, it's sad to know some people live and have no idea who their enemy is. It may never be who you think. Many of those who hate America are now citizens of America. So true, Kippy. Ryan says, true, true, Mags, now the hegemonist in Grenada is communist China. And finally, oh no, not finally, well yeah. Ernesto Jose says, let's be frank here. The revolution did great things in education, economically, econo economically, okay, I give up. Um, pilgrims, so there you have it. Like I said, you can go watch the entire segment we did on Sunday. Very interesting. I'm glad that I did that program because while you may agree or disagree with the statements that were made, um, I think they got 
people thinking. At least that's what I've been picking up. That's the feedback I've been picking up since uh, we did that program on Sunday. Quick break, GIS report. Good morning, good morning. Green Lake Meter Reader. Morning, Mr. Meter Man. I'm glad I caught you. Last month, I got a very high bill, and I don't understand why. Last month, we were not able to access your meter, so we had to estimate the bill. This will happen if we don't get an actual reading. So what can I do to ensure that my meter is easily accessible? Well, you can get your licensed electrician to move your meter outside of the gate or directly in front of the house. That way, I'll have easy access and I won't have to deal with your dog. Ah, butch. Yes, dogs can be a problem sometimes. On one occasion, I was attacked by a dog and police had to get involved. Customers who don't want to cage or tie their dogs should really move their meter and make it easily accessible. Well, I'll consider that. Thank you. Grenlake, energizing our Grenada. A natural disaster can change your life in minutes. Preparation is the best protection for your family and business. Prepare now. Create a disaster plan and make sure everyone knows what to do. Store water, non-perishable food, and medication. Remember basic emergency supplies such as batteries and flashlights. Trim overhanging trees. If trees near power lines are unsafe to trim, call Grenlec at 237 for assistance or advice. Install surge protectors to safeguard your electrical devices against outages and intermittent surges. For more information, visit Grenlec.com. Grenlec, energizing our Grenada. Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates, 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and their 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com. When you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. Government to begin putting 40% of money from National Transformation Fund into Contingency Fund next year. Details of this story and more in the National Report. Welcome back with the details to the news for Monday, October 28th. I am Sherry Ann Noel. The Government of Grenada has pledged to honor its commitment to place 40% of money from the National Transformation Fund, NTF, into the Contingency Fund from November 1, 2020. That decision was announced by Leader of Government Business, Honorable Gregory Boeing, in the lower house on Monday during a special sitting to make amendments to the National Transformation Fund. Amendments Regulation 2019. The move to commence payments into the Contingency Fund by November 2020 is supported by the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. Government was advised that by November 1, 2020, a minimum of $10 million should be placed in the fund. In the case of a national disaster, a maximum of 2% of GDP per year for a period of three years or the cost of the national disaster over a period of three years, whichever is smaller. So even though you have one billion in the fund, you can't say, well, a disaster hit us. I only need 300 million, but then I'll take a 500 to do other things. No, you can't touch it. It says here what you can use it for, and there is a maximum of 2% of GDP you could take out. No matter if you, your damage is 60% of GDP, you could only go from there and take 2% out. So you'll still leave things 
within the fund. The leader of government business said amendments have become necessary as government continues to move toward fiscal prudence. The NTF was established in 2013 to place money collected from the Citizenship by Investment Program, CBI. The NTF finances various projects in Grenada to benefit industries like tourism, agriculture, and alternative energy. Minister Bowen highlighted some of the amendments which focuses on the new schedule for the new regulation. Payment into the contingency fund. It says at the beginning of every month, the last uh, regulation 11 said at the end of every month, since 2016. But now we have agreed to at the beginning of every month, 40% of the inflows into the National Transformation Fund from the previous month shall be placed into the Consolidated Fund. There is not too much of a difference here, or only it was at the end of every month. <clears throat> and here we see at the beginning. On use monies of the National Transformation Fund in accordance with Regulation 122. That is, you have monies remaining in the Transformation Fund when they end, put it in there too. Moving along, Grenada and other regional countries are meeting here over two days to explore the range of benefits that can be derived from the Belt and Road Initiative, as put forward by the People's Republic of China. Addressing the Caribbean-China Belt and Road Implementation Conference at the Radisson Resort, Foreign Affairs Minister Honorable Peter David said this is critical given the inherent structural economic challenges that restrict the pace of development of small island developing states. He listed some of these challenges as small economics of scale, access to development and concessional financing, middle income status graduation, vulnerabilities to climate change and extreme weather patterns. Minister David said in this vein, we must engage external partners, be it bilateral or multilateral, in the process of our sustainable development as we seek to achieve a more equitable and lasting brand of development. We are here to understand exactly how we can benefit from the concessional financing made available through this initiative for the benefit of our peoples. We are here to understand how we engage based on our individual, financial and economic conditions. We are here to engage on how to access this financing without undue strain on our, on our already small economies. The Belt and Road Initiative presents us with a range of concessional financing with reasonable terms and conditions. We therefore must negotiate what is feasible and affordable for our economies. The Foreign Affairs Minister says the Belt and Road Initiative presents the region with a range of concessional financing with reasonable terms and conditions, and as such, there is need to negotiate what is feasible and affordable for our economies. The initiative is meant to enhance political relations, economic ties, security cooperation and people-to-people -people exchanges whilst promoting regional connectivity, establishing an economic cooperation framework which is open, inclusive, balanced and beneficial to all so as to maintain regional peace, security, stability and sustainable development. Although BRI covers a range of areas of cooperation, over the next two days, we will focus specifically on access to financing, infrastructure cooperation, and tourism cooperation. To date, more than 130 countries have already signed on to this initiative, including eight CARICA member states, namely Grenada, Barbados, Antigua, Suriname, Guyana, Dominica, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago. This is the National Report. More news after the break. Did you join the public service on or after February 22nd, 1985 and have since retired? This might be important to you. Government understands that the NIS pension may be insufficient to take care of your needs. So, while it awaits the court's ruling on the matter of pension for public officers, government has taken action to protect your quality of life so that you can take care of your needs in the meantime. Persons who joined the public service on or after February 22nd, 1985 and serve continuously in an established position for a minimum 26 years and 8 months and retired at age 60 may be eligible to receive an advance payment which when combined with NIS represents 70% of their last salary. For more information, call or visit the Pension Secretariat in the Department of Public Administration Ministerial Complex 440-3767 Welcome back. 
Vice Secretary General of the National Development and Reform Commission of the People's Republic of China, His Excellency Su Wei, says Caribbean countries are important partners of the Belt and Road Initiative and will benefit from the opportunities created by the BRI. His Excellency headed the Chinese delegation for the China-Caribbean Conference on the Belt and Road Initiative implementation. He says relations between the People's Republic of China and Caribbean countries on the Belt and Road Initiative have made a good start. So far, China has signed cooperation agreements on the uh, Belt and Road with eight Caribbean countries, including Grenada, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Dominica, Guyana, Jamaica, Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago. A number of senior officials and representatives of the, of the Caribbean countries attended the second summit of Belt and Road Forum on International Cooperation. China is ready to deepen the alignment of the Belt and Road Initiative with the development plans of the Caribbean countries. Strengthening, strengthening infrastructure development, enhance industrial competitiveness, and build logistic and business networks to benefit the people from China and Caribbean countries. His Excellency Su Wei says the BRI follows on the principles established from the Silk Road spirit, that of advocating peace, cooperation, openness and inclusiveness to obtain mutual learning and benefits. It also focuses on policy coordination, connectivity of infrastructure and closer people-to-people -people ties. As of now, China has signed 197 BRI cooperation agreements with 137 countries and 30 international organizations. 50 countries have signed on the joint statement on pragmatic cooperation in the field of intellectual property amongst countries along the Belt and Road. The network of enhancing cooperation on taxation matters has extended to 111 countries and regions. On connectivity of infrastructure, significant progress has been made in the construction of international economic cooperation corridors and passageways, which has played an important role in establishing and strengthening the partnership of interconnection amongst countries. The two-day conference will conclude on Tuesday with remarks by His Excellency Dr. Zhao Yongshen, Ambassador of the People's Republic of China to Grenada. And finally, small manufacturers and agro-processors are no more equipped to promote their products following a one-day workshop organized by the Ministry of Trade, Industry, Cooperatives and Caricom Affairs in collaboration with European Development Fund, EDF. The project focused on the packaging and labeling of local products to promote them on the global market. The project is being funded by the European Development Fund. The workshop was one of three components of the project, which also comprised a baseline assessment and a survey where five companies will be identified. At the ending of the project, we would have you know, five companies in Grenada um, that would, the packaging and labeling would be upgraded to meet international standards. And um, it's an ongoing initiative, so um, we have the baseline study so going forward, the ministry will continue to work with you know, other companies, um, other agro-processors, manufacturers locally in terms of you know, helping them to improve on their packaging and labeling so that at the end of the day they can export more of their, their products. Director of Trade, Junior Mahon. Levy Global, a Trinidad company, is on board. Dr. Olania Poon, consultant, Ministry of Trade, spoke about the company's involvement. We are here in Grenada to do a very special workshop with the small and medium-sized enterprises here in Grenada. And the main objective, our main objective, is to help companies grow their business and to make more money, to create more employment, to capture export markets. And the workshop is really about understanding the customers of the future, who they are, how we can understand how they think, feel, and behave, and how we can target our products to meet and exceed the expectation of those clients and guests and visitors of the future. And one of the main things we're looking at, we've done a baseline study among the companies here in Grenada, and we're looking at helping at least five of the companies improve their packaging and labeling to cater to and to capture more of the export markets globally. 
And with this, we come to the end of the National Report for Monday, October 28th. On behalf of the entire news production team, I am Sherry Ann Noel, thanking you for viewing. Alrighty, folks, that's uh, last night's edition of the National Report from the Government Information Service. And um, let's see here. I do have a few comments. Uh, first of all, Cassandra Mitchell says, We are still awaiting justifications from our Minister of Finance, read the National Transformation Fund, that exempts it from the fiscal rules and laws. Our supreme law, the Constitution, speaks only of the Consolidated Fund for Public Spending. Someone, please explain this. So says Cassandra. Ryan Jaban says the leader of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping, originally announced the strategy during official visits to Indonesia and Kazakhstan in 2013. Belt refers to the overland routes for road and rail transportation, called the Silk Road Economic Belt, whereas road refers to the sea routes or the 21st century maritime Silk Road. Cassandra comes back here and says, where and when were the consultations with the people before the Belt and Road MOU was signed? This is our future. We, the youth, would inherit these debts or risks or risk the chance of having our major infrastructure possessed or owned by a foreign power. What are the terms and conditions of these agreements? Mm -hmm. She goes on to say, we aren't against development projects, but you are deciding our futures for us. Young people, why are you so silent? Ryan Jaban says, the Belt and Road Initiative is a global development strategy adopted by the Chinese government involving infrastructure developments and investments in 152 countries and international organizations in Asia, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and the Americas. And let's see here. Finally, Kipling says, I wish I can get a copy of the dictionary that our government uses, since the meaning of what that often says is often different from those of the dictionaries many of us are accustomed to. Okie dokie folks, okie dokie folks. Break time and uh, we'll come back and wrap it up. 
Juve chocolates, cocoa nibs, and cocoa balls from Diamond Estate Grenada are now available at Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, Amazon.co.uk, and GrenadaMarket.com. Try the sensational touch of nutmeg and a touch of ginger chocolates, 75% dark and rich, 100% pure cocoa, and the 60% dark and sweet chocolate bars today. Amazon Prime members enjoy free shipping on these orders in the USA, Canada, and Europe. GrenadaMarket.com. When you can't come to the island, the products of the island will come to you. We're going to pull the curtain down with a parting word from the Holy Scriptures. And today's reading comes to you from the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 10, verses 17 to 20. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Matthew 10, 17 to 20. Okie doke, interesting morning, interesting morning, but is there ever not an interesting morning here on Good Day Grenada? My dear friends, thank you so much for joining us. I uh, just took a look outside there. It seems like the showers have disappeared, at least for the time being anyway. Thanks for joining us. You have a good day, and may God bless you today and always.